Well, this is, um, this is a hard question. This is a hard sermon. It was a hard sermon, a hard question to think about and to try to write about. I was up last night, and I looked at the little clock on the top right-hand corner of my Mac, and it said 1147, and I was starting the sermon again <laughs> for the third or fourth or fifth time, because it's just not, where is God when you're suffering? What kind of a question is that? I don't, it may be the hardest one that we've dealt with so far, because as a a pastor, I believe, and I've given my life to the belief that our God is all good and all loving and all powerful and all everything, all wise, but yet my experiences almost seem to contradict that. There was one that I was thinking about last night as I was writing and scrapping and writing again, and it involves this hat right here. I had seen it earlier in that night in our son's room, and it's connected to a memory from four years ago. I went, it was Cade's birthday. Cade's was turning four years old, July 22nd, 2012, and we, my parents always send a big old box of gifts full of, I mean, we get our kids something this big, and then my parents get them 20 gifts that are each this big. And so my parents called up, and we got to open all the presents with the parents on the phone, and so we did, one present at a time. Oh, what'd you get? And everybody goes crazy, and everybody laughs, and it's so wonderful. And my parents sang happy birthday to Cade, and we finished happy birthday to you. I said, all right, I love you, Mom, love you, Dad. We'll talk to you later in the week. Okay, great. And my dad hung the phone up. My mom hung her phone up, and we went about our business. And about an hour later, my phone rang again, and it was my mom, which is strange because I have a very strict one-time-a-week rule (laughs) that she and I talk one time on Sundays, and my dad one time. It's since college on, that's, that's it. So it's weird for her to call me. And I picked up the phone, and she said, in a very calm voice, I think you're going to want to sit down. And so I sat down and I said, what's, what's going on? And she said, your dad's been in an accident. And he, he went to the Walmart right after he hung the phone up with Cade. And he got out of his van and he left the van running because of his, and she might have said a bad word, dog that was in the, the passenger seat, and I don't know if he didn't, didn't get, the, the, get it all the way in park or something slid out or something, but when he got out of the van, the van rolled over him from his right ankle over to his left shoulder blade. I, I didn't get to see him. People wouldn't let me near him, but people just said it was very, very bad, and he's been airlifted to the hospital in Rochester. And over the course, that was about 5.30, over the course of the night, until about midnight, we just were waiting for updates from the hospital. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? And the final word we got at one in the morning was, there is no more we can do. His liver is as bad as we've seen a liver if he's going to survive. We tried a procedure to stop the bleeding. It didn't work. And so at one in the morning, either my father was going to bleed out and die or he would somehow live, but the feeling at that point was, it's probably over. And I went to bed, and I tried to sleep. And every time I fell asleep, I expected in those moments I would think about all the, I'd have a a bad vision of my dad getting run over by a van or something, but I didn't. Every time I closed my eyes and let myself drift off, it was Christmas morning again. And I was there with my parents opening presents and, and, I, and, and that was a nightmare at that point, and I'd wake up. And after that happened enough times that I just would quit trying to sleep, I went out into the living room, and I sat down in the middle of all the presents that my parents had sent, and this was one of them. A hat that my parents had had monogrammed. It says Kate on one side, but on the back, it's got a fish. Because it was Sunday, and we were flying out Tuesday to go to New York, and one of the key pieces of that trip was my father and 
Cade and me were going to go fishing for the first time. Cade had never been fishing. And my dad and I used to go all the time, and so we were going to have a, a father-son-son fishing trip. And I was doing all right until I picked this hat up. And I just sat there in the living room and wept. I just convulsed. Because at that point, I had lost my father, whether he was there or not. And I sat there and thought, really? A guy who's pretty darn young, a lifelong Christian, an elder in the church, the most devoted husband and father and grandfather you will ever see in your life, and this is how he's going to go out? Killed in a freak accident? And he didn't die. The bleeding stopped. So praise the Lord for that. And we had person after person after person say, it's a miracle, which takes us back to last week. Was it a miracle? Did the medical staff do something? Was God involved? Was it all science? But it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And I'm okay claiming, yes, God was involved in that. It's, it's, that's awesome. It's unbelievable. But then I look out at the world, and I see a lot of folks for whom a miracle just doesn't happen. They get the bad news, or they endure the tragedy, and then they have to endure the grief and the loss and everything else. This morning, I opened up the thing, right? We've got the, hurric or the, the earthquake in Ecuador, 77 people dead. The coast is ravaged. The atrocities of ISIS that they make videos now of and put them out. They go viral. You can watch how awful these things are. But then I stand here and I look out at all of you and I know the things that have happened in your life. The ones that we know about after a year together and, and all the same questions come back when you take all loving, all good, all wise, all everything and put it up against our human experience. Why does God give us the ability to feel such deep pain? If God is all good, how does evil exist in the world he created? If God is all loving, then why do pain and suffering exist in the first place? If God is all wise, why could God not think of a way to achieve his objectives apart from evil and suffering? And if God is really all-powerful, why did he not create a different kind of universe? That's why it's hard to preach on this question, because as a preacher who loves God and believes in God, and has given his life to this whole ministry, I want to launch right in with the philosophical reasonings and the theological reasons and all this sort of thing, and they just sound so hollow when you start typing them out, so you have to scrap it again and again and again. Christian writer Matt Whitlock says this, the standard answers, and most of the time the philosophical answers, no longer work. The young girl who was gang raped, is not going to be consoled to learn that dark shades are added to the canvas to perfect the painting. That evil is merely the absence of good, or that God does not want us to be robots, so he gave us the choice between good and evil. This world of ours is chaotic, incoherent, and constantly morphing like a cosmic kaleidoscope. How do we address the problem of pain? Why are we reluctant to admit that the answers handed to us by our Christian teachers don't really satisfy us? Why are we given the impression that if we question God, we are somehow losing our faith? Is it all right for us to say that life stinks? To say out loud that the church's answers are not the answers at all? We all struggle. Why are we not taught that it's a good thing to let people rant sometimes? about how God let them down and admit that there are days when we feel the same way. What would happen if we put aside our pat answers to pain? What if we simply admitted that life hurts, it's not always easy, and sometimes our misery brutally challenges our beliefs about God? That's what Matt Whitlock asks. And so I kept coming back to that quote of his over and over as I went through version 4 and 5 and 6 of this morning's sermon. 
And so what I'm left with, I think there are two truths that, that just need to be proclaimed about this question. And the first is this. If you are suffering, if you are in the midst of suffering and pain, it is okay to be angry, it's okay to doubt, it's okay to question, and it is okay to grieve. It's okay. If you're suffering, it's okay to be angry and to doubt and to question and to grieve. That is okay. And I want to be emphatic about that truth because, yes, the Bible says, the Apostle Paul says about Christians, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. He says that. What he means is we don't, as Christians, let ourselves just give in to despair. We have a hope, and so we can cling to that even in the worst of times. But I've heard it interpreted so many times and I've seen it lived out in the church as Christians don't grieve. Christians are happy people. We're shiny, happy people. And if you're Christians, it's all rainbows and sunshine because God is good and God is in control of everything. And so you can just be happy and put on a happy face and you're not fully dressed without a smile and all that sort of stuff that's utterly useless when you actually face real pain. In the church, I've, I've made a joke, and please don't think I'm criticizing you if you've said this to me. I'm, I'm really not. I've told my wife that I, I'm assuming I'm going to die before she does. And so, it's statistically, it's reasonable, right? So I've told her, if, when I die, you put the words, a celebration of life, on anything related to my funeral, I am going to find a way to reconstitute myself because I'm going to be cremated and claw out of whatever hole you've put me in and haunt you for the rest of your life. Because it's great to celebrate a life, but we also got to be real. Celebrating life is great. Calling grief and pain, not a funeral, but a celebration of life, to cover over the fact that we're upset, that's not good. It's unhealthy. You only have to look to the Bible for examples of people who are crying out, shouting out to God, and shouting out at God in the midst of grief. It's okay. Go home, read the entire book of Job. There's too many examples to even start listing. Job calling out God in the midst of his pain. Read the Psalms. Read through them. There are Psalms of triumph and Psalms like Psalm 23. I fear no evil. But there are also Psalms like Psalm 44, which is talking about all the bad things that have happened to Israel. All this came upon us, though we had not forgotten you. We had not been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path. But you crushed us. Do you hear how they're talking to God? You crushed us. And you made us a haunt for jackals. You covered us over with deep darkness. For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake, Lord. Why do you sleep? Now there's some honest grief in the Bible. And if you needed one more example, how about Jesus on the cross quoting one of these Psalms of Lament, Psalm 22, when he cried out to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me alone? Why have you turned your back on me? So in the Bible, not only are people willing to cry out and be real about their grief, but from these examples, they're absolutely willing to question and to doubt and just to rant a little bit. I think there is a point. And you know, you've seen it. You've seen people who grieve as those who have no hope. People who eventually get so caught up in their grief that they can't live today. And that's not healthy, that's not good. But for those of you in the midst of suffering, it's okay. It's okay. Grieve. Give yourself the space to do it. And that brings us to the second truth. If Jesus can rant and give himself the space to grieve. Maybe we can too. Well, that leads us to the second truth. When you look at Jesus, you see this second truth. Followers of Jesus are called to be with those who are suffering. 
followers of Jesus are called to be with those who are suffering. The reading from Hebrews that Liz read to us, Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. What do you see when you fix your eyes on that cross? You see someone who is fully God and fully human on a cross stepping right into the middle of human pain and evil and suffering. He became the victim, the victim of all that pain and all that suffering. He took it all in himself. He walked right into the middle of it so that he could heal it and redeem it. Through his sacrifice, he brought the healing. Through his sacrifice, he brought the victory. He was no longer a victim, but because he was willing to make himself a victim, he became a victor. He gained the victory. He healed the pain. He healed the brokenness of the world through that act. And for us who have our eyes fixed on him, through the power of his spirit, our call is to do the same thing. Just as Jesus went right into the heart of evil and pain and suffering to heal and redeem it, Jesus, by his spirit, sends us out to go right into the heart, right into the middle of evil and pain and suffering to show the world that God is doing something about this. God is bringing healing and redemption even to the worst pain and suffering imaginable. That's our call. Again, Matt Whitlock, who you heard from earlier, he says this, Do you suppose it's possible that many people in popular culture would love to know that Christians hurt too? And that Christians are willing to listen to others and will be compassionate and not attempt to answer the unanswerable questions. Do you suppose there are many people who either know our answers already or don't care to know them, but who would be grateful to learn that being persons of faith does not mean we never doubt? It means that we eventually move beyond our doubt. Do you suppose these same people would be thrilled if we just sat with them, listened to them, and admitted that as much as we love God and believe in Him, these sorts of experiences cause us also to ask the hard questions. Could that kind of honesty build greater trust and comfort than anything else? And I think I know the answer to it. As I think back a little farther than the first story I told you, in 2010 I did a wedding for a wonderful young couple. He was in his early 30s, she was in her mid-20s. He'd been married before, it didn't work out in a, in a pretty major way. He was getting a new lease on life, and so they met, they fell in love, it was wonderful. She started working in the church's nursery, fantastic couple, and we stood together it was late October in 2010, and we did their vows. It was fantastic. And then on the Saturday night before Thanksgiving, about a month later, the phone rings, and I pick it up, and it was a woman I knew. It was the mother-in-law of the bride. I said, hey, what's, what's going on? And she said, I have some bad news. Jennifer was killed in a car accident tonight. And what do you do? What do you do when you're in the morgue that night with the man who's been in his new lease on life, second marriage, for just over a month and has to identify the body of his wife? What do you do when you gather at the church with all the same people wearing the same robe, standing at the same pulpit where you stood a month earlier to do wedding vows and now you're standing over a casket? What do you do? What do you do when there are no words to say and when the 
dumb pet answers we use in the folk religion, like God never puts more on you than you can bear. Everything's going to be all right. They're not just useless, they're hurtful. What do you do? You do the only thing that will ever provide an answer to the question, where is God when you suffer? You walk right into the heart of that pain and that suffering, and you live with the people who are suffering. That's it. You bring Christ's Spirit into that place to show them that where is God? God is right where He's been the entire time. There with them. They'll know it because you are there with them. So take God's healing into the places of suffering in the world. Amen.